There you go. Okay, yeah, this is totally spontaneous, uh, no written remarks, but uh, just wanted to thank everyone for coming. First of all, it's an exciting time for our confinement collaboration, which is, uh, this is the first true workshop of the collaboration. We had the kickoff meeting in September. Since then, we've been uh, kind of trying to keep in touch long distance, but it's extremely important to bring people face to face as we're finding out. And we're very grateful to uh, uh, Alexei Chairman, who is uh, the local organizer, and also the FTPI with Alex Kamenev uh, as the director for giving us an opportunity to meet here. Uh, I think. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I just personally, I, I was here a few times back, back in the day when there was a series of uh, meetings called Continuous Advances in QCD. And when I asked people, why is it called Continuous Advances? And uh, the response was somewhat muted. Well, the lattice people weren't so welcome. <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they, were, they were the, the discreet people. <laughs> <laughs> of course the advances uh, the advances were happening continuously and uh, uh, so now we're back and i want to say lattice people are very very welcome we actually want <laughs> want the lattice to show us the way i think we're in a new era of uh, greatly improved numerics uh, anyone who is a skeptic and, and would say this problem is 50 years old, well, first of all, it's good to, to look back 50 years. I'm enjoying greatly reading the old papers. You finally find out what's in them and what's not in them. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and back then, there was no quantum computing, no machine learning and uh, all sorts of new theoretical ideas that are coming together. So I really look forward to an exciting meeting. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming again. Um, okay, well, since Igor started the tradition of putting on a microphone for, for this, I'll also do it. Um, right, so I just wanted to make a few um, logistical uh, comments. So first, this workshop would be impossible without the generous support of the Simons Foundation, so thanks to them. Uh, it also would be impossible, as uh, Igor just said, without the support from the FTPI and Alex coming in. And I'd like to especially call out the, the enormous amount of work that was done by uh, Megan Murray and Alicia Canfield over the last uh, several months to make this all possible. They're the local admin staff. And like anything that actually works during this workshop is because of them. And anything that fails is because of you. Okay, so um, uh, one thing you might be curious about is whether you have to drag your bags around all the time. The answer is no, if you don't feel like it. In, you can leave them in the room next door and throughout the day, either Megan or Alicia will be there and we'll keep an eye on them. I mean, they're not security guards. So if you have like you know, state secrets in your bag, then reconsider, but uh, otherwise, you know, you can leave them there. Um, we'll have coffee breaks with some light snacks. Um, you'll be on your own for most lunches and dinners, except for Thursday when we have a conference dinner. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention that you please try to stay on time during your talks. Uh, we have relatively short talks with the idea of preserving as much time as we can for unstructured discussions. There are lots of whiteboards, including behind this wall, over there, down the hall, for people to break up into smaller groups and discuss. You can also use the whiteboards behind these projectors. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we have lots of time for discussion and we don't blow past all of our uh, deadlines. Um, and then the last couple of things I want to say is if you object to your talk being posted to YouTube, please tell us as soon as you can. Um, also, these, uh, these talks are being recorded. If you want to be on the video, you should stay around here. Don't go walking off over there unless you don't want to be seen. Um, if you want to write something during your talk and you would like the uh, eventual YouTube audience to see it, I'd recommend writing it here. And um, also there's a step here. Please mind the step and don't fall off. Uh, that has never happened yet in meetings that I've seen in this room, but there's always a first time. So let's, let's not have it during this workshop. Um, the next to last thing I wanna say is we have a pointer. Um, I just found out that this pointer has a storied history. This is Misha Voloshin's pointer. 
And so over its life, it has pointed to amazing results in QCD and about confinement. So please be nice to it. It's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not as sturdy as, um, you know, one might hope. Um, and uh, let's have a lively, respectful, and uh, really interactive workshop. So um, our first speaker um, is Raju. I think it's already on. You might have to log into your machine. Well, slideshow. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here um, at this uh, exciting workshop, uh, promise, which promises to be an exciting workshop. Um, and being here is a particular resonance for me because uh, I was a young postdoc here uh, in Minnesota uh, from 1992 to 1994, so older than a good fraction of the people in the audience. Uh, uh, and uh, at that time, it was called the Theoretical Physics Institute. And, which then morphed into the fine theoretical Phys physics institute. And, and um, that was a particularly exciting time um, because uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, we had this uh, influx of really outstanding physicists there uh, to Minnesota. Um, and uh, you know we had uh, giants like Arkady Weinstein who's sitting in the audience, uh, Schiffman and Volishin uh here at that time so uh, and we had people like Gribo coming through and so it was extremely exciting to kind of watch these uh somewhat intimidating people and uh kind of learn learn from them so uh and also um several of the ideas that I'm going to talk about actually were developed here um in collaboration with Larry McLaren uh, who was then director of the institute and then um subsequently also by him and uh, other collaborators as well uh, and so this really uh, is a testament to his impact on on, uh, on some of the things I'm going to talk about. So um, anyway, so um, what I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned, is in my title is we parked on. Um, and so why 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 do they matter? Um, so here's the kind of space time diagram of a high energy hadron collision. Uh, and so what happens is uh, the the sort of hard parked ons, which carry a large fraction of the momentum of the hadron. Uh, they, they essentially go through in the collision. This is sometimes called a leading particle effect. Um, and so they sort of go propagate along the light cones as shown by these, uh, these blue, blue um, and um, these things in blue here. Uh, while the weak partons, which are the soft partons, carrying small fractions of the momentum of the hadron, they kind of populate the central region. And they're numerous. Uh, and they lead to multi-particle production, as, as illustrated by this iconic image from the uh, Stark uh, detector at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider at, at Brookhaven. So, um, so in terms of uh, rapidity, so you, you can you can think about this in in terms of the uh, space-time uh, rapidity, which is roughly the momentum space rapidity. Uh, is, it's actually identical for massless particles, uh, and so central rapidities correspond to this region here. And so this goes from say plus infinity to minus infinity in, in, in rapidity. So I, I'm going to be talking a lot about so the rap rapidity evolution of, of, uh, of, of some of this physics. Um, and so, um, so how do we think about this uh, in QCD? So if we, this is a picture uh, that one can keep in one's mind, which is if you imagine the hadron at large energies corresponding to these uh, constituent quarks, so which carry the uh, the the uh, quantum numbers of the proton, which are then dressed by these uh, you know soft gluon clouds, uh, and now imagine that it's boosted to very high energy. So these objects get time dilated, so they live longer and longer. And say you were to resolve this with some probe on some very short time scale, which has uh, some resolution q squared. Uh, then, as you go to higher and higher energies, you're going to see more and more of these these weak partons. So you're going to see configurations into which the proton fluctuates, clock states containing large numbers of these repartons. And that's precisely what is uh, shown to you by this picture here. So this is the parton distributions as a function of this momentum fraction x. So as you go to smaller x or higher energies, 
uh, at say some fixed resolution scale, you see more and more of these weak gluons, which are then accompanied by their quark antiquark partners. These are the C quarks. Uh, so that's sort of alpha S over pi sort of suppressed. And you see that's, that's what, you, uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, so, so, so these are sort of these we partons in the collision are released as, as, as Bremsstrahlung. So you can ask, well, you know, how is it, I mean, aren't they just suppressed by the coupling uh, to see more and more of these we partons? And the answer is that the coupling is compensated by the large phase space for Bremsstrahlung of these we partons. So as you go to smaller and smaller X, this, this, uh, this factor that appears in cross sections is of order one. And so you can get, uh, so you have to sort of resum this to all orders. And that gives you actually a Markovian growth. So each, at each uh, say rung in emission uh, in rapidity, there's, there's a, there's a the, 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 the rate of emission is proportional to the number of partons there. That's a Markovian process, which is an exponential growth in rapidity or a power law in X. And so that explains this very rapid growth in the cross section. So as you go see, as you go to, uh, to say X is a 10 to the minus four, the proton is completely dominated by gluons and C quarks with the valence degrees of freedom falling off very rapidly. So uh, if you ask now, well, okay, what is the space time picture that this corresponds to? Where do these weak partons actually sit? Uh, and how do we understand this in terms of the intrinsic sort of non perturbative? Uh, dynamics of say the hadron. Uh, so the picture that I argue emerges is that as, so if you think about some sort of initial profile, which of, of say field strengths in a proton, which is localized on this distance scale one or lambda QCD. So as, as you boost the proton relative say to an observer, the, the, the valence protons gets Lorentz contracted by a factor, which is, which is gamma. So the radius contracts. Okay, so they sort of start really sort of lying on this on a sort of two-dimensional sheet. While the weak partons, they also Lorentz contract, but at a slower rate. Okay? And the question is, you know, what is the scale that characterizes this dynamics? Okay. So uh, so so even though you might think, say, at low energies kind of these live all over, it's my, what I'm going to argue to you is that these get sort of Lorentz contracted as well, but at a different rate than than which the valence partons Lorentz contract. You can also ask, well, uh, you know, what is the spatial distribution of these weak partons? So how do we see them localized? Say, if, if I look at a transverse cross section now, so if you see, have a probe that's seeing this, this sort of nucleus or sort of proton come at you at very high energies, what is the distribution of these, of these weak partons uh, in sort of in the transverse plane of this? Okay. Uh, and so these are these kinds of distributions that differential distributions that people are now talking about in perturbative QCD are often called transverse momentum distributions, uh, which give you the KT dependence of these weak partons and, and so-called generalized parton distributions, which are the distribution and impact parameter and, and trying to understand how these, how these vary with, with rapidity. So, um, so you can think about uh, actually doing experiments where you start to probe now within the structure of the weak part on cloud. So imagine you have a probe with some, uh, so it's a virtual photon say, which fluctuates into a quark antiquark dipole. And this dipole has some size say R perp, which is the difference in the relative coordinates X perp and Y perp, transverse coordinates. And they have some momentum fraction Z or one minus Z of the energy of the virtual photon. And so this is scattering off. So you can alternatively rewrite this in terms of their impact parameter as such and their, and their transverse uh, and relative separation, uh, which, which for a process like this turns out to be the relevant quantity. So here's the amplitude for say the exclusive production, say of a heavy quark pair. So you have a vir the virtual photon scatters of the proton. It produces this heavy quark pair and then the proton remains intact. And this is a function then of the Q squared for the process in momentum space, the resolution and the momentum transfer, which is given by this capital K part. And so this can be understood as a convolution of the wave function for the virtual photon to split into a QQ bar pair. 
And then for the QQ bar pair to sort of go into some, some additional final state, which is not specified here. Okay, so this is the overlap of the wave functions. Um, and, and so, and then there's this overall pre factor here, there's a phase factor. And this is then written in terms of convolution of the Fourier transform of the, the distribution impact parameter of the amplitude. And so this is sometimes called a dipole amplitude. Uh, and as I'll discuss further, this can be written in terms of correlator light like Wilson lines. So this is kind of a space time picture of, of our understanding we partons. Uh, much of the discussion of literature, literature in the past was done in momentum space in terms of Feynman diagrams. Uh, while this is kind of uh, more like a space time picture in, in, in coordinate space of, of in terms of uh, these Wilson line uh, structures. So, but uh, so, but as I mentioned, um, it, much of the early discussion was in momentum space. If you think about this in the language of perturbative QCD, uh, how do we understand these we partons? So, uh, think about say a generic process where you have say two gluons go to n gluons. So, so, so you have two hard gluons with say momentum p a p e, and so then they they sort of produce sort of n of these soft gluons and each of these has some transverse momentum and some x value momentum fractions okay uh, and so of course when you go to n large then you put a lot of these are we partons carrying small fractions of momentum photon now as i alluded to earlier um, when you go to very small x so in this so-called radio limit okay uh, you you get uh, uh, sort of the amplitudes can be described by the so-called leading logarithmic evolution in X, where you resum all such logs. So you assume that the transverse momenta are roughly the same, but there's strong ordering in X as you go to very small X. So logs in X dominate or logs in KT. So we work in that approximation. Then you can sort of resum all sort of these leading logarithmic uh, contributions by taking into account all real and virtual contributions. Uh, so there's radialization of gluons that go on, and eventually you get a Pomeran solution where you can think about the amplitude as a compound color singlet object of radialized gluons. Okay? And so you can you can compute this, and if you ask, well, what is this amplitude uh, that results? Uh, so this is now for for in the forward limit of kt equal to zero. Then in momentum space, so this is the Fourier transform of the transfer size of the dipole. As I said, the relative transfer size. Uh, you find that if you if you solve the BFKL equation that corresponds to this, uh, if you have some initial distribution which is peaked at some large kt, uh, as you evolve in rapidity or as you as you change x. You find that this this distribution, as you boost, becomes broader and broader, and in fact, the solution really filters into the far infrared. So even though you start in perturbative QCD with the assumption that your transformant are large, much larger than lambda QCD, you find that the solution doesn't respect that, and actually diffuses into this region. So that kind of makes this um, kind of construction problematic. Now, uh, you can also then go to next to leading log. So the state of the art is next to leading log, and there's already pieces of the next to next to leading log uh, equation that's been constructed. So these are then summing alpha, alpha log to the n uh, terms, and so on. Um, that doesn't really change this basic fact. It kind of slows the, the diffusion into the infrared, but doesn't eliminate it. However, uh, there's, a, there's a piece of the physics that's missing when only one considers so-called ladder diagrams where you just have, say, uh, emission of gluons along the rungs of the ladder. So if you just had one ladder, that would be the BFKL Pomeron, uh, where these two objects going down the ladder would be, say, radialized gluons, and there's some effective vertex leading to emission of gluons. Now, when you go to small x, it turns out that diagrams like these, where you can have, say, two such ladder, there's a ladder going to two such ladder, these are sometimes called fan diagrams. Uh, and this vertex is often called a triple Pomeron vertex, where so you think of one Pomeron merging into 
uh, two other Pomerans. Uh, such diagrams start to become important. Okay, so, so you can have diagrams where you have, say, two of these gluons, soft gluons combined to find a harder gluon. Uh, or you can have such kind of screening contributions. So these are actually, this is, this is, these are actually cuts that occur with different weights. Uh, and so naively, these kinds of contributions would be suppressed by powers of Q squared times some infrared scale. Uh, but then as you go to small x, as, I, as you saw in one of my early slides, the gluon distribution grows very rapidly. Okay. So, so at some, as, you, as, as Q squared gets smaller, the numerator becomes from the size of the, the denominator. And so all twist power corrections become equally important. And you can estimate when that happens. And that's when the occupancy is, is of this order here. Uh, and that's, that turns out to be, this, of, this is of order one over alpha x. Okay. okay, so you can actually solve this equation self-consistently to determine what qs is a function of x. So this is some, this is some characteristic scale when the occupancy becomes very large and all such contributions become important. Now this, <laughs> Uh, remarkably, yeah, sorry. So QS is sort of an emergent scale when all of these higher twist contributions become of the same magnitude. I'll discuss this. That's my, my, the thrust of my talk is all about this, this scale here. So it's an emergent scale. It's a semi-hard scale, uh, which grows as you go to smaller X. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, so I should mention that uh, Thinking about such divergence is actually predates QCD. So there's a beautiful paper by Weinberg. So this is this classic paper on the soft uh, photon and graviton theorem. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with it or who have not read it in a long time, I would really strongly urge uh, rereading. It's a very modern reading paper, well before QCD. And he talks about yang mills theory and why yang mills theory is problematic because of these massless gluon self interacting. And he says that there's going to be all these very complicated infrared divergences. Um, and it's to address this would be a Herculean task. Um, it's also this nice quote by, by Wilczek, where he's really referring to the fact that uh, this, this kind of perturbative Bremsstrahlen, which leads to growth in gluon distributions at small x, starts to be compensated by these recombination type effects, which actually have the opposite sign. Uh, and so there's a kind of uh, Boltzmann type process where you have perturbative Bremsstrahlen producing more and more soft gluons. And then you have reverse processes of recombination, which sort of decrease the growth in, in the number of gluons. And that leads to some kind of steady state picture at some characteristic, defined by some characteristic scale. And that's the saturation scale that I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Ah, so, 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 of course, alpha s and QCD is only decreases uh, uh, sort of logarithmically with, but uh, I'm really considering the, the, the sort of a Ray J limit where you really take s to infinity. And so, in principle, I'm assuming a very small value of alpha s. Uh, so, this is really, yeah. Yes. So, QS is, is, is a function. I'll have a plot where I'll show you these, these you know, uh, what, what that kind of looks like. But yeah, so the idea is that QS is a, is a semi-hard scale, much larger in the radial limit than lambda QCD. Yeah. Sorry? Well, you, you can decide. I just wanted to set the stage. So if I fail, then <laughs> you know, it's uh, not quite Herculean. Yes. Uh, yeah, a Herculean job requires a Herculean amount of time. And so, uh, so it's like, you know, the Odyssey, right? So anyway, so if you think about, say, think about again, this two to n process, and let's think about it in a very generic way. You say, what is the probability for say two gluons going to n gluons. Uh, so of course it's some um, alpha s to the n, there's n factorial for the different combinatorics of the gluons. Uh, and then there's this in principle, this degeneracy factor, which is e to the s for s is the entropy of, of these, uh, these microstates that, that comprise this blob that you produce, which 
comprises n gluons. Now, if you say that n is of order one over alpha s parametrically, then without this factor here, you'd find that such configurations, such classical configurations of high occupancy are highly suppressed. They will go as e to the minus one over alpha s. However, if s is of order one over alpha s, you see immediately, of course, that this can be order one, okay? So for very large values of s of order one over alpha s, you find that the probability for such a scattering is, is of order unity. Okay? Uh, and in fact, one can argue that this sort of classical lump of highly occupied gluon states uh, saturates the Bekenstein area law uh, in units of a Goldstone screening scale, uh, which, which corresponds to the spontaneous breaking of one current variance when you generate such large numbers of occupied states, uh, as well as some global subgroup of, of SG3 cases, as, as I'll discuss. Uh, and so this is given by some screening scale, which is N times this saturation scale QS squared, which, which uh, really corresponds to the maximal occupancy that can, one can generate. Uh, so essentially, the, yeah, so the statement is that the field strengths are so large when, when, when you produce such states that uh, as you try and pack more and more gluons in some fixed region in the pack parameter, there's a maximal occupancy that you can see. And that corresponds to the emergence of this, this scale QS. And so essentially the picture is that these weak partons at sufficiently high energies in the rigid limit are completely color screened. And they live on a surface of a sphere of radius, which is given by one over k plus. This is the longitudinal momentum for the weak partons. It's on the order one of k perp is on the order of the scale here. So this is the uh, plot that I was mentioning to Cardi, uh, that if you try to do this kind of a plot where you plot in the y-axis log of x or, or rapidity, uh, which is the boost, of the target with respect to the projectile probe. And then on the x-axis, you have resolution scale. The claim is that for arbitrary large Q squared, there's always a value X at which the system becomes overoccupied and you saturate unitarity. Okay. So if you imagine you have a very small probe and you boost you know, to faster and faster speeds relative to you, you're going to see a very, very dense proliferation of gluons in this very small space. And that characteristic scale, which characterizes this line, is this QS of X. Okay? So for each value of Q squared, there's an X, right, that, that gives you this maximal occupancy. Okay? So, and so you can think about this as a unitarization boundary based on the argument that I just gave you, okay, where N times alpha S is, is of order one. So, so how do we understand you know, this phenomenon quantitatively okay? uh, and, and you know, ultimately interface with experiment? And where does the intrinsic non-perturbative dynamics that we all care about appear? Okay? But before I go there, let me just mention that uh, this, this has also an analogy in, in gravity. Uh, and this is really, Beautiful work by Lipata, which is actually almost completely forgotten. Uh, see, his original paper was from 1982, and this is a subsequent paper where he, he says that there's actually a double copy. So the original double copy that people now talk about quite a bit uh, in a somewhat different context is due to Lipata, where he argued that the effective vertices for in these two to n processes in gravity uh, and in QCD have a structure such that the effective vertex, the Lepata vertex is actually in gravity is a square of the QCD one. Okay? Uh, and, and processes such as radialization and so on happen very similarly, even though there are some qualitative uh, differences. Uh, and so essentially uh, you can read this yourself. So essentially you're saying you can construct a 2D effective theory, which describes all this physics. And then this work was, was developed into a very substantial program by Mati Giacomo Veneziano and collaborators um, who uh, who sort of try to understand black hole formation in terms of gravitational shock wave collisions and so on. Um, and in fact, one can use these double copy ideas. And this is something I'm actually actively working on and hope to uh, report on sometime in the future, near future. 
Uh, but it's also amusing to realize that this kind of holographic description of weak partons that I gave you, where all the weak parton information is on the surface of this blob, was also prefigured in this very famous paper by, by Lenny Suskin, where everything's about weak partons and how these weak partons contract and so on uh, in, 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 on black holes. And uh, in fact, he thanks uh, Lev Lepatov. Now, all these works, even though they discuss intensively, uh, uh, small x and growth of weak partons, they don't really discuss explicitly this phenomenon of, of uh, saturation. So uh, can, we, can we understand this in a systematic way? And, and the framework, which developed over the last 30 years, so this is work that I started here uh, with Larry McLaren and then developed over the next uh, decades, actually, uh, substantially into an effective field theory, which is called the color glass condensate. Uh, aims to do precisely this. So again, if you think about this simple picture of a virtual photon that splits into some quark antiquark pair that probes a target, which is kind of moving along here towards the probe. And so the, the target, if it is a very dense target, has large amounts of color, can sort of multiple scatter and emit radiation, uh, soft radiation in the interaction. Uh, and you find that there's an actual born oppenheimer separation that emerges between the modes that of the target that on the order of the target so momentum so you have a very fast moving target with momentum p plus and so if you look at modes in the order of k plus and then the, the modes that are actually interacting with the probe which have k plus much less than p plus so they are sort of the result of all that bramshaw and you see that the, the, the lifetime of weak partons is in much less than that of the sources. Okay, so it's proportional X times P plus for a given K perp. And so the weak parton lifetime is very different. So there's a real separation time scales between the dynamics of these longer lived heavy modes on the light cone and those, these guys here to the extent that you can really write down them as this kind of stochastic distribution of sources, which then couple in some gauge invariant way to the full QCD dynamics of the, of the weak parton pro. Okay. So essentially for each configuration rho, and so because there's a large number of these sources, they live in a higher dimensional representation uh, of the gauge group, and you can write down a stochastic weight for the such a distribution. So each such rho, you have a copy, so this is like a replica kind of picture where you, for each such row, you have this fact of action for which you can then compute all the dynamics or whatever operators that you are interested in and then average over all possible rows. So let me consider now a specific example where you look at say this, this onium production, as I mentioned, in the semi-inclusive process uh, where you have this classical field. So this is highly Lorentz contracted. Now, it turns out that for this effective action, there's a very nice classical solution, which corresponds to the solution of yang mills equations in the presence of this iconal current, which is the stochastic distribution of large X sources at some given scale, okay? Uh, and so you can find the solution. So Lorentz gauge turns out that it's just one non-zero component, so it's alpha, okay? So this is kind of the non-abelian analog of a Coulomb field. Okay, so these are so-called globular gluons, as sometimes people call it, for reasons I don't understand. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's this non-trivial field, and, and this satisfies a Poisson equation. Okay? And so you can construct in this background, in the static shockwave background, you can compute propagators. So you can have a quark, multiple scatter in this background. So that's interacting with this classical field. And these are represented by these path ordered Wilson lines, okay, which are this row over delta perp squareds. Um, and you can also have gluons and so on. Um, and so coming back to this amplitude that I mentioned for exclusive production uh, of QQ bar pairs, again, you have this convolution of wave functions, and then you have this object, the amplitude, you can write that as the sum of two terms, real and imaginary, uh, from these light like Wilson line correlators. And these are nothing but the color singlet C even Palmer and correlator, uh, which includes all even powers of this color charge density of these color sources for a fixed configuration. Uh, and so, for example, if you were to project these QQ bar onto a J side, that's you'll pick out this, this term here. While the imaginary part, 
right? These are all odd components in this expansion of these Wollaston lines. And that's the C odd, odd around correlator, okay? Uh, and this would project, say, to an A to C uh, charm meson. And for a simple picture of this stochastic weight for a large nucleus, which projects these two up, is just this kind of Gaussian correlator of these rows. So this is say the quadratic and cubic Casimirs respectively. Yeah. Uh, and so these will project out this Palmer and Audron. So it's a very simple picture just in QCD of the Palmer and the Audron. Okay? You don't need any fancy mystification to understand that. And so you can now do evolution around this classical field configurations. So you can have all possible such gluons emitted. And the evolution equation that describes how these sources change with scale, right, is this bolitsky kopchigov equation. So for example, for the Pomeron correlator, it satisfies this RG equation with a kernel, which is this BFKL kernel. So this is the, and if I just were to ignore the second term here, that would be the BFKL equation. But now you have this additional nonlinear term. And this is a non-trivial IR fixed point, and that's what generates the QS scale uh, that, that you see. So if you start with some initial distribution, right, this has a structure which then evolves away. Uh, and so you can think about the height of this, of this uh, initial distribution that evolves away as generating the saturation scale. And so this cures the infrared uh, diffusion and transverse momentum. And you can have a similar nonlinear RG for the Orderon, that's the so-called BKP kernel, the bottle skwachinsky prashalowitz kernel. And so all of this can be systematically recovered in this. So I'm running out of time. I just wanted to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, and so you say, okay, you have this problem with the infrared, you cured it and so on. Okay, what about confining dynamics? And the point is that it really never goes away. So even if you start looking at this evolution equation with some, sharp input in impact parameter where you really kill the impact parameter tails. But even one step in the evolution, you see that you recover this Coulomb tail, which instead of grows very rapidly. Okay. In fact, when you look at large impact parameters, it grows exponentially in rapidity, while at smaller impact parameter, it really seems to obey this kind of saturation suppressed growth. And so the picture you can see emerging is that you have some kind of black test, there's a part of regime, and then there's this whole sort of non intrinsically non perturbative physics of how pions go into uh, partons go into pions. Okay. Uh, in fact, there's a very beautiful, nice paper by Steve Gupser, which uh, unfortunately is not as well known as it should be. Uh, and so if, where he, he finds a nice solution to this equation where it takes into account the impact parameter. So if you think about the S matrix as a correlator of Wilson lines given by this, what she showed is that there's a, there's a underlying symmetry of the kernel, uh, which allows you to write this S matrix in terms of some such object here, uh, which is then, uh, which can be expressed in this way here, or equivalently, it has a, geometric scaling property with the S matrix can be written as this QS times R, where this QS is then the, the maximum QS at zero impact parameter times one plus such a structure Q squared B squared, where one over Q is inverse size of the hadron. Okay. So it does it's it's just a nice representation of these numerical results shown there. Uh, it does it of course you still still see that things sort of the, the saturation scale gets to be small when you go to large impact parameters. Uh, and so I just want to say that uh, that you can actually now do experiments where you really start to probe this kind of uh, distrib distributions now. So this is the exclusive vector meson production that I talked about earlier uh, for JAPE size. And you can in, start doing experiments now, the IC, where you can try and extract the distribution of gluons as a function of impact parameter for different values of X going all the way down to small X, okay? Uh, and so you can do measurements of exclusive and diffractive processes and so hopefully this will start to really start to nail this down. So I'm really out of time. I think Alexa is looking very unhappy. I just want to mention a couple of other things. There's this very beautiful physics of color memory in the CGC, which I would uh, love to talk to you more about, where it turns out that this is a deep connection of this classical solution to that of the memory effects that have been talked about, this BMS 
uh, asymptotic symmetries talked about in the language of um, in, in gravity um, and, and the connections to soft theorems. And this is really a particular illustration which is realized in this framework where you can map this transverse dynamics of the shock wave that I mentioned to you onto the celestial sphere at null infinity. And this QS kick that I'm talking about is precisely this color memory effect, okay? And the Wilson lines are vertex operators in the celestial sphere. And the question is whether one can extract the 2D symmetries on this asymptotic uh, celestial sphere to make progress in understanding this impact parameter physics. Uh, finally, uh, can we map this onto EFT for long strings? Uh, I know that we'll have a talk by Victor towards the end of the week, on, hopefully on related to this. Uh, and, and the point I've made earlier is that this is isomorphic to a heavy quark of EFT. And so these closed loop dipole multiple Wilson line correlators are analogous to what's sometimes called potential in RQCD. The latter is well known how it's mapped to lattice into EFT for, for long strings. There are many experts in the audience. And can we do the same to address these we parked on confinement large impact parameters? And we need to find the right map. So this is actually a plot by Harvey Meyer and Mike Tepper. But they show that in gluodynamics, you, you can sort of extract these blue ball trajectories. Uh, and the question is, can we sort of construct something similar to understand we part on dynamics at uh, large? So I'm very sorry. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Well, well, I mean, yeah, so I mean, of course, I was at Minnesota at that time, and it was a big topic of discussion and holy grail functions and so on, right? You remember this uh, holy grail function? Or, yeah, I think this is a qualitatively different phenomenon, I think, because uh, this, yeah, yeah, I don't see the analogy. Because here you're really tree creating this classical lump. And I think it's really the large entropy of this classical lump that's that we're, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Oh, it's, there's a calculation. I mean, you can actually calculate explicitly that you get this Balsky Kopchikov equation is an explicit illustration of the the uh, the saturation of probability. It's actually an infra, you get an infrared fixed point from first principles calculation. It's a generalization of the EFKL equation, and you can compute. So let me just complete my answer. There's there's also the computation of this to next to leading log and even beginning to next to next to leading log accuracy by Simon Carnwood and collaborators. So it's not not just qualitative. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so I, I had to really skip a lot. And so what you actually get is is a hierarchy of endpoint correlators. Okay. And that's called the Balisky Jim Wilk hierarchy of equations. So you have two point correlators of Wilson lines, related to four point correlators, and so on. You have a full hierarchy of multiple correlators. It turns out that in the large NC and large A limit, the expectation value of product of traces factorizes in the product of expectation values, and you get a closed form expression. So this BK equation is very specific for large NC and, and also a large A, which is the initial condition that you put in. Uh, and so, but in general, you get a whole hierarchy of correlators. It turns out that because of physics is two plus one D, you can rewrite this whole hierarchy as a Langevin equation in functional space, and you can solve it numerically. Okay, so you can compute all endpoint correlators numerically on a two D lattice. Okay, and and so that's kind of uh, and you can so you can look at the structure of you know quadrupole, sextuple, and those have quantitative experimental significance because they are accessed in various measurements at the LSC 
and and uh, future electron ion collider. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have another question. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Y
Well, this I guess I just said because I, I want to study like the last one. You say that this is the relevant to the generic Then you say, when the start, you really start to you know, that's separate from the lowest Then I also have to see just the Okay. That was, uh, there is a there is some other issues where actually, when the plan is divided into the states, Yes, yeah, 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 which has yeah. some skill in body. Right, right. Exactly. So, 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 you like that? Yeah, but you don't the equation. Yes, yes. So I have P minus P. Right? Uh, so when P squared is the new one, But it's hard to get rid of the because it's when the aim is all about their outcome. 
And for them, I mean, when you say that there is a multiple fixed point, you're actually, I mean, you're actually using, I mean, when we say something and read some scale and variance, we very big scale receivers very heavily used on common variance, so right, by right. dragging functions, you know, right. in a formal basis. So, so, so say you could only listen to this point, you like, find the same oh, the S matrix is there some some new term that is uh, yeah, it's, it's so, so it's it's just that it's just an only new term right it's the same term Yes, there's no kind of turn of it's not getting much of it. And this 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 is the dry is this this is And, and what Elser showed is that there's additional symmetry where even for which is all that takes the factor in third, right? Because in principle, you have you know five vectors, right? You have this curve, y curve, uh, you know, and, and, this, right? and so when the k equation makes a simplification of the lot of the way, basically, you know, you know, you know, you know, the zero method comes. Standard and then things just depend on the difference. Now, what comes to show is that the, this kernel, and this is some test of this subgroup, and this is the symmetry which they want to allow you to. This kernel has a Exactly. Uh, that's the obvious invariance of the yeah, that is like a, like, well, exactly. But Gatsa, like what he said, but it's also useful for this one here. Exactly. Um, right. And he found that there's this geometrical scaling property there in the extended greater form of this, which is that form that I mentioned. Yeah. This is the size of the So, so, so it's this SO3, you know, uh, so it has some additional location. But this does not cure the confinement problem. But what, yeah, what, what we were, yeah, we were mostly yeah. trying to understand uh, yeah. what's large and strict by gen and what was known about that from the field. And uh, so I understood a little bit. Uh, and uh, but um, uh, yeah, but there's this, this statement that on. Paper, like the degree that there is this truncation uh, like that we can that there are some sort of super selection second. We can solve, we can truncate some part of the input space, which is the relative x, and solve it. And kind of in principle, if they're powerful, then also you know and you can include corrections to running or what's happening or whatever, we find exactly that. And then in principle, so what I would in my talk, yeah. I mean, Want to say, yeah, but yeah. okay, so here, yeah, yeah. should be something like this. So, this is the part we need to do the right? So, this is where this effective stream is where we have yeah. to compute something, and okay, this is where the DPL uh, and then, of course, it becomes harder when we go to small c. That is the regime that's kind of on the because here. Okay. Formally, uh, even we start with our S is infinity, but at some point we can keep out for two square and this, this, and this is, is small. This is the large B, right? This is exactly the yeah, large yeah, B. Yeah, that, that, that is, that is the, 
Like basically, like we were trying to, like, but the point is that yeah, okay, there is some understanding here, not some problem. But the ideal is right, like this right, 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 Assume that right. they all are the functions, right? And then we'll try to connect this. Then kind of the okay. Let's test that step, of course, right? right. But we'll be learning this thing, and then right. well, this we can develop a bit further. And the idea that we can have yeah. invent some sort of maybe integrable approximation where we can just go right. and okay, we know right. that the exact series is not integrable, but the hope is that okay, let's have some integrable because here we have some integrability, right? Let's try to find a theory which here okay, agrees very close. Okay, then here maybe it deviates, right? And here again agrees with, right. uh, with the real. Right. But the whole thing is integrable, right? Uh, while black is real. This is right. some integral, right. Right. right? Here must be close and here. Right. So that is what we are, right. the, the false. What yeah. the, what so, the so, so, yeah, so, so the, uh, this, this, is, this is great. And in fact, we should discuss it with people. I hope to discuss it with Victor. And I think so. And that's just, you know, uh, my response to right. right. this future. So we should discuss more. But uh, the, yeah, so we just want to start discussing what we want. You know, it's just that the, the I mean, what you're saying is a sort of really full on. Problematic because you have things like the Pomeran, multiple Pomerans, and so on, which come in. Uh, and so, but are yeah, these yeah. things one of answer that's no. So that is that, 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 non, that non linear term is, is really that's essentially the triple formula. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. something that okay, you yeah. should I keep being yeah. because yeah. if I think of Pomeran right. screen, right, then people interaction of Pomeran is right. one of answer. Right? Now, I'm not saying, okay, the point, what, what I say, I'm not saying that we can find two, that there are a rigid trajectory that we spawn whether it is of the wrong with right. so Yes, yes, you are. Exactly. Exactly. We have this exactly. axiom. With exactly. Price, I know, I know. But, yeah. Yeah. but okay, yeah. but say we yeah. have some trajectories here right. Right. that maybe uh, to correspond to a quadruple or yes. Five, yes. right? Yes, so to find those trajectories, right. we need right. the consider right. right. the space. Right. And they also continue, and then here they become yeah. something that they're... yeah, but it's not it's not really you know between this integral this object traces so you can place some x d right and and this you know, it's, it's so, like, are you saying that even if we take sort of the leading objectives, so at all, this is just fact wise, yeah, right? But it's a good Well, time. I guess the good news is you can give your talk now, and you say that that is the right <laughs> you could, you could thing that must extrapolate, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 must not have to yeah. 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 Much. Yeah. 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 yeah, I understand, yeah, well, yeah, it's still the same kernel. Right, it still has the same uh, form of yeah. properties and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk. I saw your paper. Yeah, so yeah, it's a sort of a project project yeah. learning project. Yeah. 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 I have never done any. Keep the right No one had done this precise thing before. There's there's surprisingly little work on basically non-supersymmetric theories with adjoint matter. And let's say there has been over the years some work, but not nearly as much as you would think, given how Oh, Rich it seems to be uh, so, yeah. I mean, it's like, of course, uh, okay, so scalars like, are. Uh, can I can I ask? Uh, this plus, good. you have USB C uh, ports. Uh, can we use those? Because then, okay. if you use those instead of yeah. instead of HDMI, it will work automatically. Uh, if you don't mind, because, uh, it's possible to switch it to work with HDMI, but it, it will be automatic, hopefully. And then so this there is some whatever it's important we right. up on that, right. Right. Uh, and then it, they, yeah it, it really works so yeah exactly and you, to, you know, we don't have a uh, clicker so you'll have to just use the power to and then slide or everyone then it's yeah are you saying this is wrong this point i think it gets more yeah okay so that's the way to think about it this will be the microphone yeah testing yeah it's actually on right now so if you so 
So there is she, and then there is Fedora, and then there is and then I, and thank you by the way so much. Yeah, and then basically the sign of the <laughs> so uh, I think it's time to get started. So next we have three slightly shorter talks. Uh, and the first one is by Shi Chen from the University of Tokyo. And I'm very happy to say he's going to be coming here in the fall uh, to join the collaboration at Post Up. Uh, so she, go ahead. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Yeah, it's really nice to meet you guys here. Uh, yeah, I, okay, so my name is just the she, forget about the family name. Uh, and uh, yeah, I come from the University of Tokyo, Japan. Uh, yeah, and it's really nice to be here to uh, join this uh, uh, some collaboration conference to talk about some topics related to the uh, confinement physics. Uh, yeah, my uh, research is in collaboration with Yuya. Uh, so Yuya is also there. Uh, he will give another talk. Yeah, like two days later, I guess. Uh, and uh, yeah, because I'm now suffering from the jet lag. So if I say something too stupid, please correct me, Yuya. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, from this title, uh, you may think that my talk might be a little bit off the topic because I'm going to talk about the generalized symmetry. Yeah, but uh, yeah, actually, this is uh, also close to related to the uh, confinement physics because we know that uh, the one from symmetry is very important to understand confinement. And uh, we know that confinement is a very non perturbative phenomenon. So, in order to understand it, we have to look at the mathematical structure of non perturbative uh, quantum field theories, which is very tough. Uh, and uh, then, in this case, generalized symmetry provides us a very uh, important tool to understand the infrared physics. Uh, because, for example, we can look at the Hooved anomaly, uh, and also we can look at the uh, selection rules predicted by the uh, generalized symmetry. And also, we can consider its spontaneous breaking. Uh, all of these constraints uh, uh, infrared physics. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, generalized symmetry uh, is also important for. Uh, any non perturbative phenomena, including confinements. Uh, yeah, for example, just as I just mentioned, uh, the confinement is very, uh, is tightly related to the higher form symmetry. Uh, we know that we can characterize confinements uh, by some one form symmetry. For example, if we know that the center symmetry of the uh, Yamil theory uh, is not spontaneous broken, and then we can see that, oh, we have some confinement phase here. And uh, similarly, on the Buell side, if we see some uh, magnetic uh, higher form symmetry, if it's, all, uh, if it's spontaneous broken, and then we see that we have uh, a confinement here. So this is somehow a dual description. So uh, in this sense, uh, as I, uh, because I assume, I assume that you, are, you guys are very familiar with uh, higher form symmetry. So, uh, but also let me uh, slightly introduce what is higher form symmetry. Uh, for the ordinary symmetry, uh, the uh, generating operator for this symmetry is a co-dimensional one uh, topological operator. Uh, but if we look at higher co-dimensional uh, topological operator, then we can create a uh, so-called higher form symmetry. Uh, so it's typically called a p-form symmetry for co-dimension p plus one topological operator. Uh, and um, the important center symmetry in confinement physics is uh, uh, one form symmetry, which means that the uh, its topological operator has co-dimension two. Uh, so this is uh, what we are familiar with. And uh, but actually, the allowing different dimensions is just the beginning uh, to get generalized symmetry. We can also generalize symmetry in many many other ways. Uh, here I present two important ways. Yes, the first way. Uh, is to consider the interaction between different dimensions. I mean, for example, if we have some uh, co-dimension P uh, topological operators, 
uh, if we connect them together to make some uh, to make a web, then on the junction, uh, we can have some uh, higher co-dimensional uh, topological operator. So in this case, the topological operators in different co-dimensions will interact with each other, and to make up a more complicated uh, uh, algebraic structure. So in this case, this kind of symmetry is typically called a higher group symmetry. So for higher group symmetry, uh, we cannot simply talk about, uh, for example, one form, two form, three form. Uh, this is not so good because they somehow mix together with each other. So we have to regard them as a whole. Uh, this is one of the important generalizations. Uh, the second generalization, uh, which is called the non-invertible symmetry. Uh, in this case, uh, we know that typically uh, we believe that the uh, symmetry action is invertible which means that we have to use a group to describe the symmetry. Yeah, but uh, recently people realized that in some cases, uh, this might not be true. Uh, we might have some non-invertible symmetry action. So in this case, uh, we cannot use a group to describe the symmetry, but we have to use some other more complicated objects. So in this case, uh, we have the non-invertible symmetry. Okay, so, uh, since we already know that the high, form, uh, the high form symmetry is already important enough to uh, constrain the infrared physics, uh, this is also the case for higher group symmetry and the non invertible symmetry. Uh, so, uh, people found many examples with higher group symmetry or non invertible symmetry, and the people use them to constrain the uh, infrared physics to find a lot of interesting uh, phenomena. And um, this is a background. And uh, in this talk, I and Yuya, uh, we found some interesting connections uh, between different kinds of generalized symmetries. And uh, uh, so here I'm going to give an introduction of our funding. Uh, and uh, the key of our funding is something called the solitonic symmetry. Uh, this, the name might be not so uh, familiar, but uh, yeah, it's actually, uh, some very uh, classical object. Yeah, in short, the solitonic symmetry is uh, generated by topological functionals and it acts on defect operators. And it tells as a selection rule of solitonic excitations. I mean, the excitation which can be regarded as solitons. Uh, so here I give two uh, simple example. Yeah, we can consider the uh, compactified boson. And in this case, because the, uh, the, target, uh, the target space of the pass integral is uh, the loop S1. So we have a non-trivial uh, homotopy group pi one. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, an according sonitonic symmetry, which is D minus two form. Uh, and um, its uh, generating operator is given by this kind of expression. Uh, it's not a defect, but a functional. Uh, so we call it a topological functional. And its charged operator are given by some defects, uh, depending on the uh, space time dimension. We have different uh, defects. And uh, when we try to evaluate this kind of expectation value of defects, and uh, we will find that uh, inside this loop, for example, or between these two dots, uh, the classical solitary configuration will appear uh, to give a contribution uh, so that we can get, for example, this kind of area law. Uh, or if we do not have a potential, we just have the conformal behavior. So uh, this is a typical example for the solitonic symmetry. Another familiar example is the Maxwell theory. Uh, in the Maxwell theory, uh, I mean, U1 gauge theory, uh, we have this kind of homotopy group, pi two of the classifying space of U1. Uh, I denote it as BU1. And uh, in this case, we can uh, similarly construct this kind of solitonic symmetry and the charged objects uh, are at hoofed uh, points or at hoofed lines. Uh, so I guess this is also another familiar example. Uh, so the, I and Yuya found that uh, the solitonic symmetry uh, might be a very interesting tool for us to understand more general generalized symmetry. Oh, uh, sure. Oh, okay, so in this case, for example, yeah, let's consider the uh, uh, 
you have space time uh, three D uh, space time dimension, and in this case, uh, this is like the multiple multiple defect. Yeah, yeah, and in this case, this is like also the multiple defect, but because of the space time dimension, so it's not a line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can call it the water line of multiple. Yeah. So if we increase the space time dimension, we will have like a surface and so on. Yeah. Okay, so uh, according to the previous slide, uh, we find that uh, the D minus P minus one form solitonic symmetry uh, is given by the punctuation duo of the according uh, homotopy group, IP. Uh, and uh, this leads us to ask a question. So because the pi p uh, might not be comm uh, commutative if p equals one. Uh, in this case, the punctuation duo of this pi one is not, uh, how do you say, informative enough. Yeah, well, if we know the punctuation duo of pi one, we may not reconstruct the pi one itself. So we lost, we lose some information. Uh, so the question is then what is uh, correct symmetry to describe this situation. Uh, and then we have to think about uh, the, some, some, some subtlety uh, in understanding this situation. That is because we have a difference between the free homotopy and the based homotopy, uh, which means the, uh, how do you say, the uh, deformation class of maps from a S1 to our target space, uh, this set, is different from pi one uh, because pi one is defined as the based homotopy of pointed maps. So uh, if we take this kind of difference into account, we will find that actually the real uh, set of information classes of this map uh, is classified by the conjugacy classes of this pi one. So uh, as long as we know this fact and we can try to construct the symmetry operators uh, for this case. And then we'll find that uh, the topological functionals on S1 uh, must be spanned by the characters of irreducible unitary representations of this pi one. And uh, the fusion, uh, the how do you say, something like the group multiplication is given by the tensor product of the representation uh, because this kind of uh, relation of the characters and uh, because we now have representations of dimension higher than one, so this kind of uh, fusion rule might be non-invertible. Uh, this comes from the non-commutativity of the pi one group. And uh, so in general, the D minus two form symmetry, uh, D minus two form solitonic symmetry is given by the uh, Tanaka duo of this pi one. Uh, this is a mathematical name. So its algebraic structure is described by a symmetric tensor category instead of just a simple group. Uh, so uh, this is the case for the uh, pi one for the D minus two uh, solitonic symmetry. And we can understand this story. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah we, can, we can consider the, all the representations, all the finite dimensional uh, representations of this pi one, and uh, they have some relations. For example, we can add them together, or we can tensor them together. So in such a way, they form somehow uh, some, some uh, algebraic structure. And uh, that algebraic structure is called the Tanaka duo of this uh, pi one. Uh, which is a tensor category. Uh, so it is far more complicated than groups. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, let's discuss it later. <laughs> yeah, so the key point is that this is a non invertible symmetry. It's not a group because for in group, we must have invertible elements. Yeah, so this, this, this is a key point. Yeah, so and then. Uh, we can understand this, uh, actually the, the story I just told now, this is not some new story. This is uh, some well-known story. And uh, uh, we can understand this story by this kind of construction. Yeah, we can consider another quantum field theory with the target space as a universal cover of 
uh, the original target space. And in this case, uh, in this new theory, the pi one uh, is actually a zero form symmetry in this new theory. Uh, then we can obtain our original theory by gauging this pi one symmetry. Uh, so, which means that we can have this kind of relation. Uh, we gauge a zero form non commutative symmetry, and then we get a d minus two form non invertible symmetry. So, this is a relation. Uh, uh, somehow we can call it a, somehow a duality relation. And at the mathematical level, we start from a group, and on the dual side, we have the sonitonic symmetry of its classifying space. Uh, and uh, I and Yuya want to generalize this relationship to higher dimensional sonitonic symmetries. And uh, so in this case, uh, we must know some uh, deeper mathematics. That is every topological space uh, is related to a higher group called its fundamental infinity group. Uh, yeah, roughly speaking, uh, in this kind of complicated structure, yeah, we uh, take, or how do you say, uh, it includes all the information of all of its, uh, me to, I'm sorry, because the time is running out. So can I just, yeah. okay, okay. So, uh, okay, let me be brief. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this fundamental infinite group is, uh, how do you say, vast generalization of the fundamental group. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, each uh, topological space uh, can be realized as a twisted product of uh, this kind of classifying spaces of the homotopy groups. So this is called a post tower. tower. Uh, okay, so in such a way, uh, this result is called the homotopy hypothesis, which means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the uh, higher groups and uh, the homotopy type of topological spaces. Uh, so as long as we know this fact, we can uh, establish, uh, we can generalize uh, the, the, that, that classical result uh, which means that if we gauge a non-abelian invertible symmetry, we will obtain an abelian non-invertible symmetry. Here, abelian means commutativity plus factorizability. Uh, as I mentioned, that in higher group symmetry, uh, different form uh, the topological operators of different dimensions mix with each other. Uh, then that is called uh, unfactorizable. Uh, so fact by factorizable, I mean, uh, we can decompose the symmetry into each forms. Uh, so, this is a new duality I and Yuya want to uh, study. And at the mathematical level, yeah, this is uh, the same. We find the duality between higher group and uh, some sort of symmetry of a topological space. So, okay, this is my last slide. <laughs> so uh, in short, yeah, I and Yuya uh, want to establish the Tanaka duality uh, between non-abelian uh, invertible symmetry and abelian non-invertible symmetry. And, uh, then we propose that uh, every abelian inverse symmetry can be realized by the solitonic symmetry of a proper topological space. And uh, we also find that the solitonic symmetry generalized in this way is a very good cohomology theory uh, for mathematicians because uh, as long as uh, if two topological space have the same solitonic symmetry uh, in all dimensions, then we can see that these two topological spaces are uh, homotopy equivalent to each other. Okay, so this is all about my talk. So I'm sorry that I <laughs> take a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, I think this is a classical case. Yeah, so we want to. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. So, so this slide, I'm going to use that position slide in Is this just for discrete symmetry? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're for not this. Saying that there is obviously an invertible symmetry in Yanko. Yes, you and Yanko. If you have the same coupling, it's exactly zero. Well, and then the connections are flat. But then, then, then it's, yeah, sure. 
flag connections in yeah, yes, indeed. Okay. Yes, you can uh, consider flag. Ah uh, yes, yeah. I have to add a discrete here, <laughs> uh, or, or we can just couple the flat uh, gauge field. Yeah, that's also possible. Yeah. Ah, uh, examples. Yes, I can give some examples, but if is the time okay? So maybe we'll we'll have a like a chunk of time after the three quarter <laughs> talks for more discussion. So maybe let's move on to the next talk and then swing back to this. If that's okay. Yeah. Is that okay. Is okay, Emily. Uh, all right, so okay. let's uh, let's thank she. Thank you very much. Should be very easy. You just plug into his USB C port and uh, attach this to your lapel and she just did. Uh, okay, thank you very much for organizing this uh, workshop. So today we'll talk about this uh, two dimensional models of QCD and some interesting properties of them. It's, it's like very known history from uh, very well known topic from the 90s, but I will give some fresh look on that and give some interesting new uh, results. So first of all, let me uh, explain why we should care about two dimensional models. Uh, first of all, in 4D, we have too many degrees of freedom. In quantum chromodynamics, we have uh, two polarizations of gauge bosons, we have fermions, it's too much. So it would be nice to somehow reduce the number of uh, interacting dynamical degrees of freedom and still have the quite solvable and uh, uh, tractable model. And the very nice way to do this is to consider such a theory in two dimensions because of now the uh, gauge boson will have D minus two zero uh, dynamical degrees of freedom and model will be only dynamical sector will consist only of the fermions. Uh, so such approach was firstly uh, suggested by Tuft, where he managed to show that such models could be solved exactly in the large end limit. He considered just like a QCD couple to uh, fermions in the fundamental representations, and he managed to show that in the large end limit, uh, in the light gauge, the number of diagrams uh, gets decreased uh, by quite large number, and you will need to solve just one simple Dyson Schwinger equation like this one. And you can show, first of all, that uh, quarks become infinitely heavy, and the singlet states uh, that, uh, that you produce by combining uh, these quarks be, acquire some finite mass and follow rigid trajectory. Uh, so you see that uh, it provides quite nice and solvable model. Uh, model. But uh, the question is what we can learn about uh, theories with other representations. Uh, why we should care about them is because of in 2D, as I said, there is no dynamical gauge uh, bosons, but it would be nice to have some avatar of them, like uh, some matter in the adjoint representation. And the nice way to do is just add uh, fermions in the adjoint representation like this one. But now the uh, model becomes not so solvable because of uh, now singlet uh, states, uh, like in the theory with one uh, with fundamental Quark's uh, single states was quite simple, it's just uh, bilinear of these fields. But here you can combine quite complicated states like this one. States you can put uh, adjoint fermions on the necklace and uh, they will be singlets. Therefore, such a system of equation will be quite uh, complicating. But still, we can study such a system numerically and try to understand what's going on as we change the mass of this uh, adjoint uh, fermion. And now you can uh, see that, for instance, if I study the mass of the first uh, uh, massive fermionic and first massive uh, bosonic state, actually I took this table and picture from uh, this uh, nice paper by uh, Ross Dems, Igor Klebanov, Lokilin and Silvio Pufu, you can see that at some particular point, uh, the mass of, uh, of the first massive fermionic and bosonic state 
uh, coincide at some point here. You can say just a mere coincidence, but actually if you study the spectrum of uh, uh, other massive states, you will see that at this point, they uh, precisely coincide, suggesting the system becomes uh, super uh, symmetric. Uh, we can uh, show that it becomes supersymmetric just by studying analytically properties of this model using uh, light cone quantization. In this situation, we pick the gauge where we set, uh, uh, we integrate out gauge bosons and uh, treat one of the light cone coordinates as time and the other like space time. In this quantization, we effectively remove uh, gauge bosons and the spectrum consists only of fermions. And we can write down the following uh, Hamiltonian, like this one. Uh, this one can be thought as uh, kinetic energy in the P plus direction. Uh, this one is just a remnant of the gauge interaction. So just like pull on low in two dimensions. And after that, we just need to find states that diagonalize this to operators P minus and P plus. And the product of them would give you the mass of your spectrum. Uh, by studying these uh, two operators precisely, one can find that uh, if we consider such operator, first of all, it computes with P plus uh, operator because of it doesn't carry any momentum. And second of all, if you take a square of such operator, it will precisely coincide with this operator P minus if you put the mass to be equal to this uh, value. You see that this operator is trilinear and field psi, therefore it mixes fermionic and bosonic states. And therefore, it will act non trivially in your Hilbert space and give you exact uh, symmetry or degeneracy between fermionic and bosonic uh, states. Uh, such result uh, was first shown by Professor Kutasov here, and it was only shown in the light point quantization. But here, I will try first of all to derive it in the path integral approach, and second of all to generalize it to other uh, theories with other field uh, uh, contents. And the uh, interesting thing is that you should uh, set the mass of the adjoint fermion to non-zero value here. Because of naively, you would expect to have uh, uh, that the system becomes supersymmetric at zero mass. Uh, so let's uh, try to understand what's going on. For that, let us consider the most simple model of uh, quantum chromodynamics, namely just quantum electrodynamics, where I have just uh, my U1 gauge field f minus squared and a bunch of massless fermions with some charge qi. Uh, we know solution of this model. It just consists of n minus one massless fermion with zero charge and one massive scalar with mass given by these masses. Therefore, to make such a theory supersymmetric, we can just simply add uh, fermions with zero charge or in the adjoint representation of U1 group is a given mass and we would get automatically a supersymmetric uh, uh, theory. So it provides us very nice toy model that we can test and understand what's going on here. And maybe we can apply it later to understand better QCD, a supersymmetric point at QCD. And one of interesting uh, predictions of this toy model is that the mass of the supersymmetric points depends on the field content uh, of the massless uh, fields. Yes. What? A joint representation of U1 is just zero charge. <laughs> no, I, okay, I should uh, I should have been clear. It's like only massive states will be super uh, symmetric. Like, and the main minus one massless fermions will completely decouple. And we will see the same in QCD. Um, so let me uh, carefully look at super symmetric Schwinger model. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I will uh, massage a little bit this uh, model. I will consider my field A mu and decompose it into the gradient part plus dual gradient part with the use Helmholtz decomposition. After that, uh, fermions do not depend on alpha, so I can easily remove them from my model. Second of all, beta could be also removed from the action by gamma five rotation. But the price that I pay for that is that now I have to introduce this, such a term in my Lagrangian because of the measure of the fermions is not invariant under such a, uh, rotations. And after a little bit massaging, I get such an action here. That reminds me oh, that looks like a supersymmetric U1 Bezunina Didden model. And if I uh, come 
add back the mass of the adjoint fermions and uh, young Mills action in this notation, I will see that this action as a perturbation of my free CFT here. And if I demand that this perturbation uh, 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 preserve the supersymmetry of original free action, then I will see that mass should be equal to precisely the formula given in the previous uh, slide. So uh, maybe we can use the same approach in QCD. So I will try to uh, massage a little bit QCD Lagrangian such a way that it look like resuming a Witten model uh, plus some perturbation and will demand that this perturbation uh, uh, respects this uh, supersymmetry of underlying resuming a Witten model. Uh, actually, we know the supersymmetric extension of such a Vesumina Witten model. You just take your favorite Vesumina Witten model, this Grace group, say G at level K, and just act a bunch of uh, uh, fermions in the adjoint representations. Then you can easily get that for any K, there is exist a supersymmetry uh, written here, such that if you are right with such supersymmetry, the action changes by the total derivative. And you can check also uh, using radial quantization that is satisfy usual commutation uh, relations. So, yes, and they do not couple to fermions. Yeah, yeah, they're completely coupled, but uh, system becomes supersymmetric. You can show that if you couple them, it will flow to the. Uh, that they will decouple. Uh, irrelevant. No. Yes, it was shown in the in the paper by Knizhnik in the eighties. Okay. Okay. So now let me show you how uh, to get such a supersymmetric Vizumina Witten model from Kusti Lagrangian. I'm going to play the same game. So I start with. Uh, my uh, uh, young Mills action coupled to the bunch of uh, to one uh, adjoint fermion with mass with this mass and bunch of uh, uh, massless fermions in different representations. By choosing the uh, light point gauge, I can massage the section in the following way. And after that, I can again rotate away all this dependence on psi minus, but now I also should rotate the uh, my fermions is a joint representations because of their charge for non-abelian group. Then uh, I can bring uh, this Lagrangian to the following uh, form that has basically the form that I want. So it's just like supersymmetric Vesumina Witten model plus some uh, perturbation. And now if I demand that this uh, the underlying uh, uh, supersymmetry of this uh, uh, model is respected by this perturbation, I can get the uh, mass of my uh, adjoint fermion must be equal to this value where k is the uh, level of Vesumina Witten uh, model. So from that, uh, we see that by coupling such a system to the bunch of uh, uh, fermions in different representations, we can uh, shift this uh, supersymmetric uh, uh, point. And also maybe applying the same technique, maybe we can able to construct n equal to supersymmetric QCD Lagrangian by considering QCD as a perturbation of n equal to as the mean Witten model with some uh, massive uh, uh, perturbations, but there is some uh, problem because of this uh, n equal to as the mean Witten model are usually cassette models and it's kind of hard to see them from QCD Lagrangian. Okay. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, you can show that uh, if you consider, say, massive adjoint fermion plus massless adjoint fermion, you can uh, construct such operator Q minus using actually the same from supersymmetric Vesumina Witten model. And if you take square of this, you will see that it's exactly equal to this uh, generator of P, plus, P minus in this uh, 
Uh, yes, like this massless fermions, they completely decouple. It's like the only thing they do is just shift this uh, level of as an Yes, so it's like you have massive states that have exactly degeneracy, but the muscle states completely decoupled, but they do not even feel the presence of this uh, uh, gauge field. Uh, it's a massive, yes. Yes, it's... Oh yeah, it will like uh, you won't have any muscle sector, so it will be exactly. No, it would be not super symmetric safety, but. Yes. Yes, but you can trivially make them supersymmetric by adding uh, just bosons in the trivial representation. Yes, yes, but like using this result now, you can classify them. Like, you know, you can find what is this muscle sector, and after that, you can see when it's supersymmetric or not. This one. Oops. Okay. Uh, I didn't manage to find explicitly the mass of this or not, but I see that like I constructed this uh, operator that uh, uh, trilinear and field size at matches uh, and commutes with Hamiltonian and with momentum. So it predicts that like if you manage to solve it analytically or numerically or somehow, then you must see like exact degeneracy between fermionic and bosonic states. Uh, yes, adjoint. But uh, if you find like any other supersymmetric extension of the Zuminovitan model with fermions and other representations, uh, then you can try to play the same game and maybe you will be able to find supersymmetry. And you can try to do the same for n equals two. Okay, one more question. That one, that M equals zero. M equals zero. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, mass. Uh, yes, it's very crucial. You can see that uh, otherwise uh, you wouldn't be able to construct such operators. Yes, massless, but as found for non invertible symmetries, you must have both of them massless, right? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Make sense. People keep asking me what kind of questions. I don't have a very good answer. Oh, no. I'm the one who is asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, let's let's take it over here. Do things have a USB C? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, then this should work okay. almost automatically. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is a microphone. Uh, this thing is. It's the first time using this thing. All right. Our next speaker is Yuan Chin from. Uh, yeah. uh, from uh, Yale, you can tell us about bootstrapping yeah. uh, Okay, thank you very much for having me here to give this talk. And uh, my name is Yuan Xin. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm currently at Yale University, and um, uh, I'll join um, uh, Carnegie Mellon University in this fall um, and work with uh, uh, Gregor uh, uh, Tarnoposky and. Uh, 
yeah, so today I'll share with you uh, this fun little project uh, uh, in computational, uh, numerical computation. And uh, the idea is that, um, yeah, so we want to calculate the macroscopic phase of matter from uh, like the microscopic description of a, of a theory. And uh, we know that RG flow is deterministic, but in order to extract any information in the IR from this like purely the information in the UV uh, by doing a first principle calculation, if the theory is strongly coupled is still quite non-trivial. And uh, recently in the last decades, we have like uh, uh, many success in uh, bootstrap, like uh, conformal bootstrap and S matrix bootstrap, which gave us a, a lot of uh, like of these uh, suc successful extraction of the IR um, data from just purely looking at the consist self consistency in the IR. So say we start with from any theory and uh, it flows to a CFT by looking at the self consistency in the CFT, we can extract the data from it by just looking at it. But uh, for our purpose in the confinement collaboration, we want to actually do um, a slightly different job. So we want to start with uh, some theory with some UV description and, uh, and we would like to see like, okay, so what does the RG flow lead to us? Whether the theory is, so say that we define some lattice gauge theory and in the IR is it gapped or is it, uh, uh, is it a CFT or is it something else? So uh, we look for a method that can basically give us this kind of like, uh, so we will look for a bootstrap method that can like use, uh, systematically use the UV information and also use the self consistency. Uh, and hopefully we can rigorously extract some information about the IR of the theory. And uh, okay, so to see how it works, so, we currently have, I think, uh, like a version of the, the, this, uh, this method that's working in say quantum mechanical system and lattice system. And uh, like easy example of like how this works is uh, by looking at say like the unharmonic oscillator. So we just start with uh, zero plus one D quantum mechanics with this Hamiltonian. And uh, so if we remove the interaction term, this is just a, simple harmonic oscillator. But if we add this like 40 coupling, then a lot of things become very complicated. It's very difficult to get analytic results. Um, but we can still extract very, so, so the authors here found an interesting way to extract rigorous bounds on say the uh, uh, eigenvalues and expectation values of uh, these methods, even though it's strongly coupled, um, so what they did is that they consider this thing called the, the Hankel matrix. So say that we start with some unknown um, eigen, <clears throat> eigenstate and, uh, and we have like operators like uh, X to like one I plus J. And then we just make a matrix out of like uh, the X I plus J uh, moments. Um, on top of this, uh, 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 this eigenstate. And uh, this matrix, so the unitarity requires uh, this matrix to be positive semi-definite. You can think of like, you can dot this uh, matrix from the row and the column, some vector. And what you get is the norm square of some, some, some state and it has to be positive. And by requiring this thing to be positive semi-definite and also like requiring say like the equation of motion driven by uh, commuting the Hamiltonian with uh, like any operator here we have like X to any power or just like inserting the Hamiltonian into this matrix element. And we will uh, acquire a equation of motion that relates different moments. And if you put this into this Hankel matrix, we can fix almost everything in this matrix up to two numbers, the energy eigenvalue E, which we don't know, and X square matrix elements. And then it just becomes a yes and no question. We just plug in these values. Immediately we get some numerical matrix up to some like cutoff K. And it, since it has to be positive, we can just ask, does it have a negative eigenvalues or not? If, okay, so, well, 
is it positive exam definite? If yes, then that means that eigenstate with these data is possible. And if no, then we can rule out this uh, combination of uh, um, this, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, the combination of the <coughs> these data and we can just make a plot, right? So we can choose different cutoff, like cutoff just changes the number of uh, uh, constraints you're considering. So it, at each K is still rigorous. So just, and you can see as we consider more and more constraints, we get a smaller and smaller island of the energy eigenvalue and the possible uh, expectation value of X squared. And this way we can get a pretty, we can get a rigorous bound on the data of uh, the unharmonic oscillator just purely from the description of the Hamiltonian. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, this is zoomed in to the first uh, eigenvalue. So you can get series of islands. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pinned down to like 1%, basically. K is this uh, dimension of this Hankel matrix. It's the maximum power that you consider. Uh, yeah, max power of X. Yeah. Uh, no, it just, yeah, I just want to make a plot that's still visible. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, they, yeah, so it's their work, yeah. Uh, yes, so, yeah, so I didn't show a plot, but uh, you get like an island, which is slightly larger than this one for E2, and then, yeah, then on and on. Yeah, at some point, we don't have enough resolution, it becomes kind of a peninsula, yeah. Yeah, so, and then, out, basically, out of this, uh, uh, this method that I just explained, um, people in the community in the past uh, uh, number of years have, been, have done uh, uh, many different pioneering works and many of these works are done by the audience or like, people in this collaboration. And we have Anderson and Kutensky uh, and also follow up by uh, Kazakov and Zheng uh, in bootstrapping the lattice yang Mills theory. Uh, in I think uh, two and three and four dimensions. So there they consider like uh, the Wilson loop operators expectation values and the equation of motion are the loop equations of young mills. And using these, they can say like put a bound on say like the expectation value of any Wilson loops. And here I'm showing this uh, like expectation values of uh, one plug head in the lattice young mills uh, as a function of uh, the um, the Yang Mills coupling. So I'll leave the fun part to uh, yeah to to Martin's uh, talk in this afternoon. So here I'm showing that uh, this work exists, and uh, also like uh, so the group of uh, Cho Gabai. By the way, Gabai is also our audience, right? So and Lin Rodriguez, Sander, and Yin. Uh, in last year, consider the bootstrapping the easing model, I think in 2D and 3D. So yeah, here they consider like expectation value of some insertion of uh, spins in say like some region in the, in the space time. And uh, uh, the equation of motion they use is a discrete, yeah, it's the discrete version of Schwinger Dyson equation from like just varying the spins in the, in the action, in the easing action. And then they got bound on say like some correlation function of some like nearby or ne next nearby uh, spins. Uh, yeah, so there is a critical point. So I think at this point you get uh, easing. So if there's no magnetic field, yeah. And then of course, like near the critical point, uh, we have like a very long uh, correlation length. So the bound becomes worse. That's usually the case, yeah. Yeah, and here it comes my work. Hopefully I have enough time to finish this. So we consider, okay, so if we move on from like a finite dimension degree of freedom system to an infinite degree of freedom system, say like a one plus one speed dimensional spin chain, then like, can we ask this question? Like, can we get the gap out of this infinite system? Um, in this previous work, people considered uh, 
the like for the infinite system, people usually consider the energy density because if you ask like what kind of equation of motion are still there that's finite, this commutator like of Hamiltonian with any operator is still is still there, but if you insert the Hamiltonian into the matrix element and try to get the energy eigenvalue itself, then this blows up. So it's much easier to get the energy density measured than the like energy eigenvalue individually or the gap uh, to be measured in the infinite system. And uh, this is precisely because uh, so far, I think mostly we've considered the diagonal matrix element taking the brown cat to be the same. And uh, yeah, energy density just disappears in this measurement of the, those matrix elements. And what about off diagonal matrix element? That's our main contribution um, in our work. And we consider, in our work, we consider the self consistency uh, from, say, like the diagonal matrix elements of, say, like some. Okay, so here I'm using again the unharmonic, unharmonic oscillator as an example. So some operator acting on the vacuum or the, the ground state. And it has to be related to like this infinite sum of like in intermediate states between like any pair of operators acting on the brown cat. So we insert a complete uh, spectrum. And, uh, and this kind of gives us like something looks like a crossing symmetry. Uh, if people are, in, uh, if people are familiar with uh, um, uh, conformal bootstrap, this is almost like the crossing symmetry in conformal bootstrap. So we have like some operators, we can have, we can, we can fuse the operators first and then we act them on the states or we can fuse that operator to a state and get even a sum of states. And these two things after you sum over all the states have to be, uh, have to be equivalent. And out of this equation, uh, we use the equation of motion to limit down the possible uh, possible object that it can appear in this equation. And it turns out that we can write on everything in terms of like a, a quadratic sum rule. So we have some matrix element, some off diagonal matrix elements square, uh, multiplying some unknown factors, some over like, okay, so these are some over different sectors. Here is this parity all sector, we can have like parity even sector in the unharmonic oscillator. But schematically, we just get a sum rule in terms of like square of a matrix element multiplying, norm square of matrix element multiplying some, un, some, some, sorry, some known factor in terms of like the energy and, uh, okay, in terms of the energy eigenvalue and, uh, uh, Actually, just the energy eigenvalue of uh, the ground state and also the exchange state in the that we insert in the middle. And the idea is, since this thing is positive, or if we have a multiple matrix element, then the matrix elements, uh, then this thing will form a uh, positive semi-definite matrix. The factors multiplying it, if we can rearrange a whole bunch of these crossing equations to make to find like a vector alpha such that alpha dot into this this area of prefactors give you something positive for all of the energies that can go in this exchange. If that's true, then that means like if you insert, if you dot alpha into this, then you have the left hand side zero and the right hand side something positive times something positive and it's always positive. So basically that just rules out the, the, uh, the spectrum. So then how it works is that you say you start with uh, the Hamiltonian and you say, assume that the theory has a gap, uh, all of the energy eigenvalues has to be either E0 or something greater or equal to E1. And then you show that like you can rearrange this equation such that it's, uh, it's all positive for, uh, for anything greater than E1. And then you rule out the spectrum. So this way we can put a upper bound on the gap. And then we can also consider more uh, systematic, uh, yeah, we can consider different type of these uh, equations. And uh, uh, my claim is that we can also put lower bounds on the gap by considering like a number of these like uh, different crossing equations. 
But yeah, the key is that we can, now we actually can measure the gap. Okay, so the results we tried, okay, so we also tried this on the zero plus one uh, dimensional uh, quantum mechanics. And here we use the same K defined as before the maximum power of X. And uh, we see like using the same K, we can drastically improve the, uh, the precision of the bound. So previously we have like a 1% and using basically the same kind of data or slightly more because we're introducing a whole bunch of off diagonal matrix element. But at k is equal to eight, we have like eight digits. So this is like the power of uh, inserting or power of using the, uh, the information of the off diagonal matrix elements in the same quantum mechanical bootstrap. And we can also like from our bound, uh, there's also a way for us to extract an approximation of all the excited uh, eigenvalue, uh, all the eigenvalue of all the excited, or a whole bunch of eigenstates uh, of, uh, of the excite, uh, excited states. And uh, as we crank up K, these kind of things also improve. Yeah. And uh, we want to, uh, yeah, we also studied the uh, one plus one dimensional transfer field easing model. And the Hamiltonian is this following. So we have the nearby uh, coupling of sigma Z and some magnetic field in the sigma X direction. And we have a coupling H. And so transfer field easing model is very simple and people have uh, uh, analytic solution to it. And basically if we measure the gap, it's expected to have like, a twofold degeneracy, which means if you measure E1 minus zero, uh, E0, zero, you get zero for H smaller than one, and it goes linear, and the, and, uh, the degeneracy is lifted as you take like H greater than one. And this is a theoretical value. And uh, we considered this uh, Hamiltonian, and we took a bunch of operators, uh, some local operators or some, bi some, some nearby, uh, some bi local nearby insertion of sigma. So we take these operators as seeds and we construct our basis of operators using like Hamiltonian commuting with it. And we do it on the, okay, so I'll finish in a second. Yeah. So uh, we, we commute the Hamiltonian with it uh, like a number of times and we get like a, a number of operators and we get a number of crossing equations and using that, we can put an upper bound on the gap. And that upper bound in the gap improves as we take more and more crossing equations. Yeah, so now uh, let's conclude. So as a proof of principle, the self-consistency of the theory plus some UV information gives us a bound on the gap without any approximation, period. Uh, but beyond this, we, so first one can ask like, what is the efficiency of the current bootstrap? I'll say this is not very much. So we spend like hours in computing these bounds, but actually if you just like uh, take a, a direct diagonalization of L is equal to 10, this basically is much better than any of the bounds we obtained before. But I want to say that uh, the efficiency depends a lot on the basis of operators that we use. And since we don't have any intuition at the time we're doing this project, we just like chose some local operators and it seems that uh, it does not convert very well. Uh, but I wanna mention that these authors recently uh, have also looked at say transfer field easing model and uh, models in the one plus one D spin chain. And they were able to like get, get uh, like a bound on the energy density at the like, at the level of the MRG efficiency. So there's a lot of hope. So by choosing a different, basically choosing a different basis, we can achieve a lot of precision. And what about lower bound on the gap? And this thing, so, it, so we have a lot of these uh, questions, the similar kind of questions in conformal bootstrap. And the way is that to turn on, to get the lower bound on the gap, we usually need to look at the mix, uh, operate a mixed correlator bootstrap. And here the analogy is that we don't look at, just look at the operators acting in the vacuum, but we'll also look at the mixed like vacuum of first excitation. And we introduce a whole bunch of other crossing equations that, get, that gives us the lower bound. And higher dimension, 
I would just say there's no change in the key technology. So just like, uh, yeah, we, we can just straightforward, straightforwardly try it on 3D. And uh, of course it needs more work because we have to do a lot of, uh, we have to deal with a lot of more uh, operators. We have to like, we have uh, like rotation symmetries. We have to take into account all of these, but it's doable. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, there is uh, essentially no change in the, uh, yeah, in the technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, the idea is like no matter what shows up in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, insertion of uh, identity it all contributes something positive to the crossing equation. So you don't use the... I don't, yeah. So, so the idea is like, no matter what shows up in the middle, it all, yeah, it's all considered, it's all uh, bounded basically, yeah. Yeah, so we just, we have these factors. These factors come from uh, say like, uh, uh, commuting the humming. So, so these, these factors come from the applying the equation of motions. And these are completely known in terms of EK and E0. So, so basically this is, this is gonna be a polynomial of EK. And we have a whole bunch of these crossing equations from like a different operators inserting here. And each equation is independent. We can just do a linear combination of them. And we do such a linear combination of them parameterized by alpha such that it's positive for all EK, right? It's uh, trying to prove uh, this thing dot by alpha is a sum over square of polynomial of the EK. And then you're done. Everything that can show up in the middle give you something positive in the right-hand side. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Uh, can we do what, sorry? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think essentially, okay, so I don't know how well does it, uh, it the bound will be, but uh, like essentially the technology does not depend on translation invariance. Uh, sorry, is that true? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, currently this, uh, this model depends on, uh, this method depends a lot on locality. So when you commute the Hamiltonian with some operator, we better not generate a whole sum of operators to infinity, which we cannot control. But uh, if there's no translation invariance, I think it's fine, yeah. 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 Well, it's still, it's in, in principle, all of this is still true, but I just don't know how to make it finite. Yeah. Okay, so the smarter basis, I'll go to like their work. So this is introducing somebody else's work. We haven't done this, but we found this thing to be like very learnable. So what they did is that they, on this uh, one plus one uh, spin chain, uh, they use this uh, set of a, a constraint of requiring the reduced density matrix of like any number of size has to be positive, ha has to be positive seven definite. And then the lower number of size reduced density matrix has to be the same as if you take a partial trace of uh, the higher number of uh, uh, size, reduced density matrix. This is using the locality and uh, 
and uh, well, basically the structure of the Hubert space and also translation invariance. And uh, then you just require, okay, so these, these uh, constraints are obeyed up to like say N size. But up to here, it's still like positivity and, and also like tracing larger one, you get a smaller one. But up to here is still like th this problem scales like exponentially as uh, the number of sites. And the smart, uh, smart thing is that they actually considered not the positivity of not the reduced density matrix itself, but the reduced density matrix contracted with some, uh, some NZATs they got from DMRG. And once they do that, they got like basically, they got uh, a finite dimensional matrix for any number of uh, sites. And they, then they can go to a very large number of sites. And the, the mir miracle is that the ones that they say they consider like very large number of sites and they try to re uh, minimize the energy density that obeys this, all of these bounds that I mentioned uh, uh, just now, they get uh, the lower bound on the energy density that is uh, as accurate as the DMRG results, or at least as, um, as good as those. Yeah, so the kind of lesson that we learn is, okay, so we can also consider a whole bunch of operators, like strings of sigmas, and then we construct by, contracted by some NSAS of like a tensor products, like matrix product states and stuff like that, maybe we can also get a good balance. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, if anybody's audio has questions for the or for the door, they want to like group all them and ask them to come back up. For that matter, they're trying to get the last one to come back up. 